So how well do you know the Big Bang Theory? No, I don't mean the show. I'm talking about the origins of our universe. Now, you may know the basics. The origins, the expansion, in essence, the TV show theme song. But you may also know a little bit of physics, such as Hubble, the cosmic background radiation, and how galaxies formed. But what's the current understanding and the evidence that supports it? Oh, but wait, some of you don't like it? It didn't happen? And you've got an alternative model? Well, regardless of your views, I have the book for you. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing the Cosmic Revolutionary Handbook written by Luke Barnes and Grant Lewis, a book about the Big Bang Theory, what it is, and the evidence that supports it. And also, we have a little chat with Grant and Luke about their book and a few other science topics. So stay tuned. Now, I picked up this book a few months ago and I was keen to read it. I had read their first book, A Fortunate Universe, which looked at the fine-tuning argument for the universe from a scientific perspective, and I really enjoyed it. This book, the second that the authors have written, is about cosmology. So what's this book about? Well, in essence, it's about the Big Bang and the evidence that undergirds it. So it covers what the Big Bang is and what it isn't. It takes you through the evidence such as Olber's paradox, cosmic background radiation and how that's measured, the expansion of the universe and how that's determined, and the universe's composition and how that points to the early processes of the universe's formation. But it's actually more than that. The authors framed the whole book in the context of how science works, that we make observations, we build models to explain those observations, and we make predictions on those models, and then we look for evidence that confirms those predictions. And fundamentally, we modify and, if necessary, throw out the models if they don't explain and predict those observations. And then they go on to argue that the evidence strongly supports the Big Bang model. Now, to stress its importance, Luke and Grant spend their first chapter setting up the language of science before even delving into the Big Bang theory. Now, there are a number of things I really like about the book. First, they address the book to the skeptic. They argue if you don't like the Big Bang model and you've got a better model, that's okay. But your model better account for all the evidence that's out there, not just some of the evidence. Now, this is the reason they title the book How to Beat the Big Bang. If you want to beat the Big Bang, then your alternate version had better explain and predict the evidence that's out there. So they say to the skeptic, get to know your science first, know the process of how science works, and then you'll be equipped to argue your case on a more pl level playing field. Now, it's probably good to quote the authors here. Maybe, dear reader, you are one of these revolutionary voices wanting to put science right. Maybe you have ideas about the laws of physics and how they impact our views of stars and galaxies. Maybe you've tried to engage with established astronomers and cosmologists to express your ideas and explain why their views are misguided but you've received the cold shoulder. Why are academics locked up in their ivory tower so sure they are right? Our goal is to explain how physicists, astronomers, and cosmologists develop their picture of how the universe behaves, why they talk about it the way they do, and to tell you what you need to do to confront their strange ideas and begin a revolution. We'll help you build a strategy to battle modern science on a more playing field to ensure that your voice is heard amongst the scientific din. Next, the authors don't ignore the alternate interpretations of certain evidence. They respectfully examine them and then present the flaws in light of the evidence, the data. Now, to quote them, we don't test scientific ideas by interrogating the proposers, we test scientific ideas by interrogating the universe. Now, what I'll also like is that they acknowledge that there's still gaps in our understanding of the universe that cannot be fully explained by the Big Bang. For example, the inflationary period is a model that predicts some of the evidence, but it's in no way a complete model. And then there's the evidence of dark matter and dark energy and the inexplicable missing antimatter that well, still has questions. Now, even though it's written by working cosmologists, it's pitched at an appropriate level. Now, although there is an expectation that the readers have a basic understanding of high school for science, this book is not really pitched at students of physics beyond the high school level. So, in each chapter, before arguing the evidence, they discuss the physics principles first. So, you don't need to have done an astronomy course to get into the book. So, why should you read it? I think anyone who has an interest in science and is willing to consider the arguments thoughtfully is going to enjoy this book. However, I will argue that two groups 
should have this book as almost required reading. Now, if you're studying physics at the high school level and beyond, you're going to benefit from not only getting a more nuanced understanding of the evidence behind the Big Bang model, but also the fundamental concepts covered in any astronomy course, such as how we measure distances, temperatures, mass, and the age of the stars and the galaxies that they form. But what's also important is how physicists analyze data to make predictions, including uncertainties and how they are dealt with. In other words, how science works. And I think many students entering university have a reasonable understanding of the content of physics, but often they enter higher studies not really appreciating how science works. And I think this book really provides some insight in that regard. The second group I think should read are teachers of physics. Now, much for the same reasons as I've mentioned already, but I'm going to add something. We as educators can get caught up in teaching the content, especially in a very packed curriculum. But as I've pointed out, many students entering tertiary education have a weak concept of how scientists do science, especially how they interpret the data and how they make predictions from it. Now, I think it's really important that science educators not only teach the key concepts, but explicitly teach and model how science actually works. And think, again, that's one of the strengths of the book that highlights this. Now, one of the other things I really liked about the book is a judicious supply of dry humor interdispersed throughout the text, usually in a way that comes out of nowhere, but it punctuates the serious science it covers with a chuckle here and there. Now, although the contest was delivered in a way that kept me reading, I, I wanted to know more, the occasional levity made me enjoy the book even more and gave me a little insight into the author's sense of humor. I won't spoil it too much by sharing too much, but I'm going to give you a little inkling of what I mean. In the latter part of the book, they refer to the physics propensity to name everything in certain ways. You know, the neutron, the proton, the electron, the photon. You see a pattern here? And then they ask, what's the name of the particle whose mass is 925? Now, you're going to find the answer of that in our chat with Geraint and Luke, where we discuss the reasons why they wrote the book and some other thoughts about science in general. Hi, Geraint. Hi, Luke. Tell me a little bit about your background and your expertise. My name's uh, Dr. Luke Barnes. I'm a lecturer at Western Sydney University. So I'm a cosmologist and an astrophysicist. And so studying what the universe does on the biggest scales is kind of uh, what I do for a living, what Geraint does for a living. So uh, I'm Geraint Lewis. I'm a professor of astrophysics at the University of Sydney and I'm also a <laughs> cosmologist, very interested in the evolution of the universe, the structure that we see around us. And um, I think Luke and I have done an awful lot of public talks, uh, just a, done a lot of outreach. And I think we found that the view of cosmology, maybe in the public eye, is quite different to the view of cosmology in the scientific eye. So what we try to do in this book is lay out, not, not the standard picture you see whenever you pick up cosmology, pillars of the Big Bang, a little bit about, more about the relationship between observation, evidence, and theory, and why cosmologists you know, basically uh, believe in quotes, this picture of uh, a universe that started off hot and dense and has evolved to the universe we see around us today. So what was that penny drop moment, you know, you had to write the book? One of the things that you experience, even starting when you're, well, it started when I was a PhD student as a, you know, in cosmology, that suddenly an email would come out of the blue from someone who says, I've got this great idea about how the universe works as a whole. And uh, could you please look at it and verify that I'm a genius and then sort of disseminate this amongst all the professional cosmologists and make me famous, please. And we get those pretty consistently. But we often found if we reply, we'd send back the same sort of reply again and again. Something like, uh, you can't just say, oh, I'll work the maths out later. And you have to deal with more than one piece of evidence at a time. You can't just have a nice theory that explains one thing about the universe. And you have to explain the most basic and secure things we know about the universe before you go and try to explain the real mysteries like dark matter and dark energy. And having collected all of those sort of standard replies that that was that was sort of the idea for the book often in public talks there are one or two members of the audience uh normally uh older men generally men often engineers so they've got a bit of a you know a technical background who object to this picture of cosmology they don't like the picture and some of them that have proposed alternate ideas have tried to send their ideas to journals 
And of course their papers get rejected. And to them, there's some sort of conspiracy going on that Luke mm -hmm. and I are being paid by NASA to push this story of a big bang. And um, they want to know why, why is it that we uh, can publish in journals and they can't, are we gatekeepers, etc. Yeah. So it, I think the perception of science and cosmology in the public eye is distorted by, by a whole bunch of reasons and don't reflect how science is actually done. So you write in a way that your audience is basically a skeptic, a person who doesn't believe in the Big Bang. Was that a deliberate choice? Yeah, definitely. Just because, um, well, I, people like seeing behind the scenes of any, of any profession, I, I, I think. And so that was a really good chance to sort of show how these ideas got to the top. Why are, why are the people who have looked hardest at the universe, why do those people believe such strange things about, strange things about what it does and what it is and what it's made of? Mm. So that was, that was definitely one of the reasons. Mm. Uh, and, and of course, there are lots of books on the Big Bang. Mm. Um, and uh, we didn't want to write just another book that said, uh, the universe was born and it was hot and dense and it was this happened then and this happened then and this happened then and trotted out as some sort of historical narrative, we actually wanted to get to the grips of what it means by observation and how you infer something from those observations, mm -hmm. which is often missing in a story. The, the action of doing science lost in a lot of these tales. Mm -hmm. And it's often presented as scientists know this is the case, therefore you should listen. And mm -hmm. that's not the way it works. Now, science is self-correcting, that is, our models have to change when new evidence comes to light. But sometimes when the media reports on scientists getting it wrong because of that new evidence, it gets lambasted, you know, don't try science. And, you know, we see that, for example, in climate change. We see it, of course, in COVID-19 currently. Um, now, there's no easy answers here, but what are some of your thoughts on how we might correct that? It is a huge question. And... Uh, and I, I could be very careful with my word. I'm not going to diss any teachers here, but I do think that it has to go to all the way back to the start of the teaching of science. Uh, I, I think science is often presented as a series of facts. And um, f from day one, the proto scientist should be told to question anything anybody says in front of you, right? If somebody says to you that, uh, you know, if I warm up this bulb of mercury, the, why, why does it do that, etc. So, the, so it, uh, my, in my opinion, uh, science education should be educating students into constantly asking why. why. Why is it doing this? Why is it doing that? Why do you think it's this way or that way? And, and from that, uh, we already know that when we are presented with new evidence, we change our minds. I mean, you know, it's the old, uh, 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 there's, the, there's the stove there. I'll put my hand on the stove. Ow, that hurt. I won't do that again. You've got some new information. You, you updated your viewpoint. Hmm. Whereas again, science is this black and white issue. And I said, we see it in politics. You know, for a politician to change their mind, a backflip, oh my God, how bad is that? Hmm. Whereas it's, it's the correct thing to do. With new information, you need to update. Yeah. So I think it has to go back to, to day one. And I know it's hard and I, 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 I think teachers should be paid much more than they are. And I, I worry about curricula, et cetera. But I do think the, the notion of science as a series of facts has to be lowered and the questioning has to be increased. I think COVID has been a really interesting one just because um, we've seen, we've seen scientists try to do a very difficult thing. They tried to, produce a, a vaccine for a very, for a very new, uh, in this case, virus. And, you know, there's been a setback has happened at some point. And that for some reason, for some people, that's, you know, a, a reason to doubt the whole process as if, you know, as if the cure is going to come from somewhere else. Mm. Like the, you know, the best hope we have is that some very smart people who have been doing this their whole lives, look into this an awful lot mm. and do for, the, this virus, what they've done for countless other things. I mean, no, I, no one's got smallpox. Um, so, but I, I, I agree with Geraint. There has to be a, a constant, a reminder that science is constantly questioning so that when uh, scientists say we've well, had a setback, people go, yeah, that's because 
some very smart people are trying to do a very difficult thing and they don't go, oh, that's because this whole scientific enterprise thing, they're just making it up as they go. Can I just add one more small thing? I also think that, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but the portrayal of science in the broader uh, uh, community needs to be modified somewhat, right? I mean, we, uh, when I was growing up, I used to watch science documentaries on TV. Where, where are they now? Mm. Um, and science on the news, does science have to be, you know, fair enough for the vaccine stuff, but other science, is, does it have to be the, the silly five minutes after the weather yeah. when you've dedicated one third of the news report to sport? Mm. So the, um, the overall understanding and overall support for science, I think also needs to improve. I, I, I'm just, I'm on a hobby horse. I'm going to just ride it slightly further here. <laughs> Go. So, so the, in the media yesterday, there was a flag wave. Oh, look, they've given $6 million to vaccine research in Australia. Hey, look how great we are. There's a story today that uh, a sports ground in North Queensland just got $42 million for a rebuild. So, you know, we are the five minutes at the end of the news, but we are expected to produce the vaccine to save, you know, thousands of lives. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and not as personally, of course, but it's the scientific enterprise. And I think it, taking it seriously, supporting it properly, um, getting away from this idea that science can be done overseas and we'll just import the solution, yeah. I think is, is, is the way we need to go. Yeah. Now, apart from teaching students to question, as you said, Geraint, uh, what other advice do you have to those who are teaching science? Oh, I, I can kick off with that one. Again, yeah. this is one of my little hobby horses. So, so uh, there's a couple of things that um, students coming into like physics know they need to know mathematics, but there are other aspects of their toolkit, which they don't realize they need and often struggle with. So one of them is uh, the ability to write. And it's amazing how many people suddenly faced with their first writing in science struggle, the ability to program. So, so much of science now is done on, computers. So th th those are two key skills, the ability to speak, uh, you know, stand up and talk to people about their science. This, this is what one of the things we talk about in the book, the process you write about your science, you do your science, you write about your science, you talk about your science. They are key skills that lots of people haven't had any real training in. Mm. And then uh, one of the things that really bothers me about modern uh, physics education, even at university, is that it's compartmentalized. You have experiment, you have theory, okay? And everyone just goes, yep, that's science. And then how do you compare the two, right? And that issue of statistics, the comparison between your models and your data, we don't even teach until our honors year, mm. but it, it is science. It mm. is the crux of science. Mm. So knowing at least basic statistics is really, really important. But again, many students don't get any sort of um, exposure to that, uh, even when they get to university. In mm. fact, some avoid it. In terms of advice from uh, science educators, I, I think uh, enthusiasm is a big one uh, yeah. and possibly underrated. So uh, you have complete nerds like myself who sort of self-enthused <laughs> about, I was doing physics regardless. Uh, like that, I was enthusiastic about the whole thing from, from day one. But I think giving a realistic picture of what it's like as a scientist and that, you know, we all do this because we love our jobs. Like I've never, I've never dreaded a Monday um, unless there were too many, you know, admin meetings or something. Uh, but just installing that sort of uh, enthusiasm and, you know, the best lecturers I had and Geraint was one of mine, had an obvious enthusiasm for the subject, you know, uh, there was a there's a very very serious uh, academic at, at Sydney who I won't name. Um, actually, I'm about to give him a compliment, so it's Martin Disturk. Why not? Uh, who was one of my lecturers? Who very serious guy, but just sort of made a comment. He was doing a particular bit of physics and just said, you know, this was done by Einstein in one of his minor papers. Of course, for Einstein, a minor paper is something we'd all have given our left leg to have written. You know, this is gorgeous physics. Um, you know, just stuff like that just instills a sense of, you know, I think this stuff is great. It's great that you think it's wonderful as well. Now, now a slightly different tack. This is your second book together. What's the process that you have when you write a book together? We did the same thing on the both, 
on, on both books. Basically, at some point, you, you do the, the harrowing thing of opening up, we use Microsoft Word, uh, and you go new document and then a new document starts up and it's completely blank and it's terrifying. Uh, but then that went into just a Dropbox folder. We got together to lay out a rough, some, we sort of threw around some rough ideas for the, like the chapters. Um, and especially with the first book, A Fortunate Universe, if I remember correctly, there are a couple of different ideas about how we'd structure the whole thing. Yeah. Once we got that and we got the chapters, we got sort of an idea of what will go in each chapter. Then you know, we'd have a chat and I'd say, you know, I'll take chapter one this week and you take chapter four. And then, then you're never working on the same chapter at the same time and you can put them back together easily enough. So we did that for this one as well. And that, that seemed to work fairly well. And then towards the end, um, especially <laughs> it took much more time than we expected it would. But uh, we actually then, once we had a sort of draft version, we sat down together and read through the whole thing and, and made it hopefully sound like one voice rather than two separate voices. And so what's the topic for your next book? Well, we have a couple of ideas. Uh, we have a couple of uh, Word documents with words in them. So, um, so the two, two sort of ideas that we're uh, tying with, one is to do with uh, symmetry in the universe. Yeah. Uh, and symmetry is one of those concepts which is at the heart of physics, but you don't get to see really in physics until you know, you're in your later years. So what, once you've gotten to these concepts of the and the Hamiltonian approaches, then you suddenly find this concept of symmetry and then suddenly symmetry is everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but, but in our universe, it's weird because some symmetries are perfect symmetries and others are not. And the way our universe is, is because of its symmetry. So we, we've started off that one. And also we've also got some words written about the long-term future of the universe about life in the long-term future of the universe, about how we can use uh, the laws of physics as we understand to project forward. I must say, I really enjoyed the humour and jokes throughout the book, whether it's about the Bulgarian basket-weaving journal or the Dolly Parton. So who's the comic in this partnership? Was it an explicit choice or did it just come out organically? Uh, I don't well, know. Well, conveniently, you've just... so. Bulgarian basket weaving is one of his jokes and Dolly Parton, <laughs> that was one of my jokes. So, um, so we had a reviewer of our first book say they didn't particularly like the, the little comments and just say, thankfully, most of these are in the footnotes. I, I should say, like, we don't care if anyone else laughs at them. We write those jokes because, and they're from both of us, because we find them funny. Like, we think we're pretty hilarious <laughs> and we don't care if anyone else is laughing at them because we find them funny. Yeah. Uh, and so enough people have found them funny that we keep them in. So, but some people don't. So, yeah, there's no no accounting for taste. Can, uh, can I just check another small thing again? Going back to portrayal of scientists, I yeah. think it, um, unless you pick up a biography, right, you forget that they're people, yeah. and they had lives and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And and maybe by us injecting that, they people realize that even though we're cosmologists, that we are more than just the cosmology in the book. Mm. So, yeah. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, Luke. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having us. Been a pleasure. So I hope you will go out and buy the book. I'll put a few links in the description below where you can buy the book. And also check out their other book, A Fortunate Universe, which is a scientific look at the fine-tuning argument of the universe. And did you get the joke? What's the name of the particle with the mass of 925? It's the Dolly Parton. Please share this video, press that like button, and Drop a comment down below if you have any questions and consider supporting me via Patreon so I can continue to produce physics at a high school level. And I particularly want to acknowledge some of my supporters right here. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care and bye for now.